75. And uh, around that time, the term chemo prevention was coined by Michael Sporn at NCI. And uh, 76, 75, 76. And at that time, they had like, you know, uh, we are re reading the literature, and I was reading also uh, about his papers in nature and science. They were just coming back and forth. So fortunately, what happened was that I got, uh, got a job and uh, started working with Michael Sporn on his projects um, with my boss. I mean, my boss was directly working with him. So I got to learn a lot about cancer prevention and then I spent like many years in cancer prevention, uh, discovering new drugs, identifying compounds, looking at the effects. And so I want to give you the overview of uh, cancer prevention uh, and then some of the, there are like two or three figures in there which show the work probably that, that had come from our group. But then more I'll go as we go along in the afternoon session, I'll start work showing my own work. So this will not have too much of my work but chemo prevention uh, in terms of its concepts, okay? So when we look at the schematic diagram of um, uh, of a normal cell becoming cancer, so you have a normal cell. We just talked about normal cells. The normal cells get uh, uh, insult of a carcinogen, and the cell becomes initiated. So from this stage to this stage is called the initiation. And then the initiated cells, as we talked about the promoters, so they get promotion after using the effect of all the exogenous factors and endogenous factors like hormones, exogenous factors like TPA for skin cancer that we were talking about. And so you have a promotion occurring. And then after promotion, the cells become into the next phase called progression because this now promoted cell, the clone that is created, starts growing faster and it's called promoter, progression. And once the progression occurs, some of them are going to survive and then uh, some of it is going to be death because it's, it's a mortality. So you, if you use this chart from normal to cancer cell and survival and motility, you have a uh, initiation occurring so anything, any drug that you put before initiation has occurred will be anti-initiating drugs. So cancer prevention is either anti-initiating drugs or anti-promoting drugs. And the anti-initiating drugs are mostly like antioxidants and they have properties like that. And so they prevent, uh, they either induce the glutathione as transferase or they prevent the uh, um, transfer of the cells by by inducing uh, by I mean by inhibiting the phase one enzymes and things like that. So anti-initiating agents are given before the initiation. Anti-promotional agents are given after the carcinogen is given. So in experimental model, you give a carcinogen like MNU induces mammary cancers with a single injection. So you give a sing single injection, you wait for few days. Uh, usually we start after a week of the uh, carcinogen treatment. And then the promotion is going to start. So at that time, whatever compound we give is called anti-promotional compound, right? And so we have three, we have four groups. We have control, we have, to drug that we give as an anti-initiation, so we start one week before the carcinogen injection and we stop one week after the carcinogen injection. That's anti-initiation. So like, you know, the carcinogen is given in between. So here you have carcinogen, we start the anti-initiating drug here, you give carcinogen, you stop the treatment with the drug. And then if you see an effect at the end on your cancer, that's anti-initiating effect. Similarly, you start give carcinogen and then you wait for a week and start a drug and look at the effect. So if you see the effect, well, the cells are initiated. So effect is going to be anti-promotional effect. So you have anti-initiating effect and you have anti-promoter. 
and we always keep one group where we start from minus one uh, all the way through. So because sometimes what happens is that that may have a effect, overall effect. It may not have selective effect like anti-initiator or anti-promoter. So you, you give it uh, throughout, throughout your experiment and then that's going to be uh, a third group, right? And this is the one that we just kind of talked about. So there are many anti-initiators or the initiator cells, many, many anti-promoters. This is like, this list even doesn't cover, you know, one hundredth of the list that's been tested because numerous chemicals are tested. One of the things, one of the problems in testing many uh, cancer, potential cancer preventive agents in the uh, in vivo system is expense so where uh, where i come from uh, the institute has a huge big contract we have, it's called so called master agreement so we have master agreement with the national cancer institute and only two or three labs in the country have it so like ma mammary gland organ culture was was me and nobody else had it in the country so anytime a National Cancer Institute wants to test a compound, they will send it to me. So every year they'll send me 50, 25, 30 compounds to see if that has activity. The in vivo, uh, I was not the principal investigator, but I was very heavily involved. That is also in our group for breast cancer and prostate cancer and urinary bladder and so on. So we tested many, many, many compounds. And some of the compounds I cannot read it through, so I'm going to read it through my, my frame here and this has written like curcumin, EGCG, resveratrol, gingerol, just, just to name a few uh, that, that have been tested. Now when we were working on retinoids with Michael Sporn, uh, he, was, uh, he was the one who was a retinoid person. So the idea was that instead of giving vitamin A, he, he isolated the uh, retinoid compounds that are the that are the analogs of retinoic acid. Now all trans retinoic acid which is the principal component there you have a you have either retinol which is good for your eyes and then you have retinoic acid which is good for uh, considered as for cell proliferation. Now all trans retinoic acid is extremely toxic. So you cannot give all trans retinoic acid and also there is a very fast conversion from all trans retinoic acid to 13 cis retinoic acid very rapidly in the body. So, and 13 cis retinoic acid is not active. So, you have to make analogs of retinoid. And those were the ones that were tested in vivo, and they tested about 50 different analogs or more in vivo. And one that they found, which I'll show you, oh, yeah, I will come, I'll show you. So, this is just a concept of uh, cancer prevention. The reason cancer prevention was very important at a time or even now is that cancer therapy, chemotherapy really works after the cancer has already occurred. Whereas it takes about 10, 15 years before the cancer actually becomes a cancer. So there are a lot of uh, things that you can, you know, that, that's going on, cell proliferation, metabolism, signal transduction, cell cycle, Lots of things are going on in the process. So it's a, this was modified from De Flora, who is in Italy. He had put out this. I, I copied from his uh, his paper. And uh, so it's a, there is a, it's a sea of carcinogens, and there are many different things that you can do with compounds that can break any one of this one or more of this system, and uh, and you may not get a cancer. That's why cancer prevention started getting a lot of importance. Now. Before I go forward, I want to say that uh, which people, you know, like physicians or clinics won't agree or, or industries won't agree, is cancer prevention never became very popular in the clinics or in the industries. So you don't find too many, too many pills or too many prescriptions. And the reason is that uh, you're dealing with normal people. So to do a clinical trial, you need a huge number of people, like thousands, 50,000 people. Whereas chemotherapy, you can get away using like phase one trial with 10 people or 15 people. Uh, secondly, 
chemotherapy is expensive and if you and the clear and the industries can make huge amounts of money on chemotherapy they cannot make money on chemo prevention so that was the reason the chemotherapy has been given a lot of importance but then the chemo prevention is is, is a really good field to get into so this this is really from a chemo preventive agent here i had generated this when i gave a talk at one time with vitamin d and i replaced cpa for vitamin d so what happens is there's few things that are important the the fundamental thing that's different between therapy and prevention is here you don't have a disease so the effect of your drug or a compound has to be absolutely non toxic right because you can because you're not going to get cancer so why would you risk having toxicity so there is that that it has to have no toxic effect and you have food habit changes that you can do you can start chemo preventive agents in a high risk group so like for example in case of breast cancer is hereditary or if it's a brca positive uh, people parents are brca positive or somebody in the family had a cancer and i'm just saying breast cancer as a generic term because i worked on breast cancer so you know it automatically just kind of flows but that goes for many cancer that are that are hereditary okay so in a high risk group you can have the models which were talked about in earlier class all the carcinogenesis models that are that are used for this thing you can use mammary gland organ culture we'll be talking about you can do the cell transformation the cell transformation is not as easy as it sounds uh, one of my students spent like 6 months transforming the uh, mcf12 f cells which are normal mammary epithelial cells with a carcinogen and look at the effect of uh, of the compounds uh, they can we can do the colonic acf aberrant crypt foci and we can do the mammary carcinogenesis studies like mnud mba now in therapy what happens is we have to look at the toxicity of the chemotherapeutic agent is very important but there we look at risk versus benefit so in other words is the chemotherapeutic agent or treatment that we give to the patient is that going to be have a more benefit than the cause so all chemotherapeutic agents or treatments cause side effects like you know nausea and vomiting and you know the headaches and hair fall off and all kinds of nasty side effects occur but they are acceptable the people accept it because the outcome is that you are going to have the uh, you know cancer is going to be gone or cancer uh, inhibition is occurring so that is rest versus benefit for that people use the models in the cancer therapy so now we are going to use the cancer cells in the mouse so mouse is going to reject the cancer human human cells so we have to use nude mice or a thymic mice that's so the immunity is compromised there is no immunity so all the studies that are done to evaluate the effect on the tumor growth or tumor cell growth they all use a thymic mice or nude mice they are little more expensive but you can get by with very few animals they usually people use like four five animals a group in that uh, the reason is that the mice each mouse is is 50 to 60 dollars and a uh, pretty expensive study uh, so but that's what's used and then here you have a high risk group of people here you actually have patients <laughs> with cancer so these are cancer patients so so in my case i i had a i was talking at lunch time uh, uh, the the problem that i was having is that now i am trying to use cancer preventive agents as a cancer therapeutic agents so one of the things i was telling yesterday that we use cancer cells for our experiments so anything that works on cancer cells is can is therapeutic in anybody's book and we all use mcf7 and what not you know the whole list of them the second thing that i was i came up with this model is there is a uh, there is a area we really don't know in in the human or in animals that when prevention ends and therapy starts right 
when so, so I call it a prevention of progression. We really don't know when there are few cells, like thousand cells, you cannot detect. Uh, d uh, you know, ductal carcinoma in side two, DCIS. We don't know whether it's there or not in the body. So that time, I just said that well, if you continue giving the preventive agent, you are also making it work on the early cancer cells. So I, I termed it as a prevention of progression, and and this uh, this has been published also in the literature. So it's it's in my um, my CV. Uh, in some review articles I wrote, I also defined the term called prevention of progression. So you can use this compound throughout the cycle, either as prevention or as or as therapy. So the definition of Chemo preventive agent, original definition was given by Michael Sporn in 1976. And uh, so he said that any compound that inhibits or reverses the growth of a, uh, of a uh, transformed cell is called chemo preventive. And uh, in case the, the definition was modified by Wartenberg. Uh, uh, Lee Wartenberg recently passed away, he was he's very old. But what he called is the, uh, he divided them into into several different parts and he called it a, things that are like anti-initiators and anti-promoters and he, he was working on colon cancer. And then in 2001, Michael Spawn came up with a new definition to introduce the molecular aspects to the cancer prevention. And then um, um, uh, John Pazudo was is a PI on this huge big project I was talking to you yesterday about. Uh, he's, uh, he's a dean of uh, School of Pharmacy now uh, in New York. And so we wrote a paper and we said there are chemo preventive agents are chemicals or combination of chemicals. Combination of chemicals was not involved in any other definitions which can alter or reverse the expression or function of a molecular target. Because nowadays, in recent years, as I was telling, that molecular targets are important. What are the targets? Re you know, receptors uh, are target, kinases are targets, adapter proteins are targets, signaling transducting molecules are targets. So the compounds that are specifically affecting to reverse or inhibit the growth of molecular targets that are responsible for transforming normal cell or supporting the proliferation of transformed cell. That's what we call chemo prevention. This is now very well accepted uh, uh, definition for, uh, for chemo prevention. So the chemo prevention would use either natural or synthetic uh, chemical agents to reverse or suppress and prevent carcinogenic process. Now what happens is that original idea or when chemo prevention word was introduced, at that time spawn was using isolated compounds. And that went on for many, many, many years in, until even now that compounds are new compounds are being analyzed. Now the whole food concept is coming back where there are other things in the foods, as I was telling you yesterday, I gave you an example of turmeric, that the curcumin, which is very high uh, concentration in, uh, in uh, turmeric, is, is not really absorbed by human, uh, by human cells, or uh, human, uh, yeah, human cells, cancer cells. Now, if you, so Bharat Agarwal, he's a big guy in, in, in MD Anderson, recently retired, and he worked a lot on curcumin. And he's, he was telling that well, he started using the uh, whole food now because there are enzymes in there that makes, uh, makes curcumin uh, absorbable. So, and he showed the data, data on that. So I think that uh, those are the reasons you can do the target organs that we can do the uh, Taste on is urinary bladder, breast, cervix, colorectal, ovary, head and neck, lung, prostate, skin, etc. These are natural synthetic compounds that people have worked on are retinoids, big fields. Uh, retinoids are vitamin A. 
deltanoids is a term given by Michael Spohn is called vitamin D related compounds phyto D those are called deltanoids uh, that term was coined by, by Michael Spohn but it did not become as popular as retinoids and then you have a phytochemicals as we all majority of us here are working on are the new phytochemicals that we are that are derived from new plants edible or non-edible and from fruits or from any other thing and the uh, these are the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents called called NSAIDs uh, they are used because one of the studies that uh, you may have heard about aspirin, that aspirin a day is really good uh, for heart and also there was a study that was uh, for colon, that you know the colon cancer uh, was also they said take it pill a day. More recently there was a study saying that you know aspirin a day would be good for, for breast cancer. Now I give an example what happens in terms of the overall picture of it. Uh, I had a study on aspirin in 1985, somewhere around 84-85. So, it was a beautiful study. So, we had a low dose and high dose of aspirin, okay, and we gave it to the animals in breast cancer, memory, carcinogenesis profile, we gave it till the animals died. The best study you can ever see. So, that it's not like you cut off your study at three months or, you know, so no, no, nothing like that waited till every animal died of natural cause and we showed that animals uh, the aspirin had no effect when we gave it a high dose but aspirin had a effect when we go gave it a low dose beautiful statistics and all that so we talked to NCI National Cancer Institute because that's it was their money so I said we want to write this paper for science or something like that at that time or some really high power journal they said no. He said you must have done something wrong. Okay? He says that there is no way that your low dose has better effect than your high dose. And 20 years later, everybody says that use low dose of aspirin and not the high dose. So that's the story of my life. <laughs> what can you do? So here we go. So this we discussed yesterday. So I will. I will talk about it, but I won't talk about it in too much detail because remember, uh, I'll say a little bit because she was not here, so I'll tell. So we have a chemo preventive agents that could be either synthetic or natural products. It could be mixture or it could be a pure chemo preventive agent. Now the chemo prevention is either it could be in population where we do the clinical trials or we make the biomarker bio analysis for early diagnosis or it could be experimental where you have a bunch of models as we talked about cell culture models, organ culture models, in vivo models or we can do molecular chemo prevention. So we can say that okay the KI-60 is prevented or you don't have the uh, you know the P53 is uh, uh, you know is upregulated or do the uh, PCRs, RT-PCRs, those are all molecular chemo prevention uh, that we could do. And uh, these are all, many of them are func food, f functional foods. There is a concept in the United States that many universities were forming a functional food program groups uh, supported by the university. Our university had one at, uh, at University of Illinois and um, that's where, you know, Lot of lot of different people were involved, and, and good work was was going on in there. So the fruits and food is very important in that regards. So as I mentioned before, that this is from one of my very early papers. That in in, uh, in United States, uh, as I was telling that in that, that all these uh, different plant products are available in the on the shelf. One of the reasons is that the FDA does not require approval uh, for it to go on market. So you guys can mash up your drug and uh, plant and put the make the peel of the extract and put it in the market and, and FDA won't say anything. But they all have been tested 
uh, with its property like antioxidant property or the, you know some lesions some of them uh, they're, they're all different properties and then some of them are uh, strong some of them are very weak depending on where they are published uh, some are published in sort of you know uh, not very high power journals and then uh, some of them have not been scrutinized as well. But you can go through uh, each plant, what kind of activity that the plant has. You can go through that. I'm not going to go read, read it through. The couple of important ones that we are talking about is soy. soy. You have a genistein in soy, which, is, uh, which has been used quite a bit uh, in cancer prevention. You have gingerol in ginger. Uh, which is also used in a, in a, in a great, great amount and then there are lot, lots of them here. Yeah. And there are here some more. So like what I did here is that the compound like you have curcumin in, uh, in turmeric or you have capsaicin uh, in, uh, in red peppers. So I had a paper on capsaicin in Journal of National Cancer Institute which is very, has a huge uh, impact factor, uh, you know, better than cancer research. Uh, so we, we worked on that and had a paper on that. Ginger oil, all these I worked on. Uh, EGCG in green tea, janistin, soy, or uh, they're all in here. Dial dial disulfide in, in garlic. And um, these are some of the common ones. Lycopene in tomato. So, so this is one comment on that, that for example, you really have to see, like for example, lycopene is present in tomato, but it's available or it comes out only when tomato is cooked or is boiled. If you eat like, you know, salad, it ain't going to do anything for you. So, so, so you have to really remember where, where your compound is or how, how far it's going to work or how, how well it's going to come out in the, uh, in the solution. Okay, so, okay, uh, in, uh, in our drug discovery program we had a, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more later on, but, um, but then we, we go through the screening, so you have, you use cancer cells, you use mouse memory or gland organ culture, you screen, we have screened hundreds of compounds, so there was, when, when our but my lab was, was very active for MMOC, we were act, including the compound in the, the extract from here. So when our lab was doing active mouse memory gland organ culture, uh, I had practically done every compound that comes out in literature. You see the literature, somebody's paper, I said, I've done this. So it was, it was really good, like we did, we did hundreds and hundreds of them. And then what, we have, what happens is you have a parent compound that, uh, you know, that that is present in the in the chemo in the plant or whatever plant derived. They synthesize the analogs. You screen the analogs. You select the active compound using these systems. Then you have to do the uh, experimental carcinogenesis. You do molecular mechanisms of action, and then you do the preclinical toxicity, and then it can go to clinic. This step here is not done in the lab. They are, they are done by the contract labs because preclinical toxicity for a drug to do is, is a half a million dollar project. So it's, it's very expensive. Once it goes through, then you submit your folder to the, to the FDA for getting its uh, approval. Now this one I showed you yesterday because we are all getting bored with the videos. So I explained to you, but I'll go through one more time because uh, ma'am wasn't here. Professor, I wasn't here yesterday. You weren't here, right? When I described this slide, were you here? No. Okay. So uh, we have a huge, big program. Uh, now it's no longer there, but it was for 15 years. And every year, the National Cancer Institute gave six, seven, eight million dollars a year to do that. It was a composite program with uh, with with many uh, PIs, many uh, principal investigators in their own respect. Some. Like we had the Doug Kinghorn, uh, who is a um, uh, who is editor in chief for Natural Products. We have uh, Norm Farnsworth, uh, who passed away now, but is considered father of pharmacognosy. 
we have John Posido, who is a dean right now. He was a PI of the project. Uh, I was involved in it. Uh, then you have a Bob Moriarty, who worked with a couple of Nobel Prize winners. He's a synthetic chemist. And uh, so this is you know, a really big, big involvement, huge, big project. Uh, Richard Moon was my boss, uh, who, who is an in vivo carcinogenesis person. So what happens is that you select the plant from various countries, including India, spices, whatever. The plant, either we make the extract here, if it is India or Peru or wherever, because our reservoir came from the grapes from Peru. So you make the extracts, you evaluate the extracts in seven bioassays, and those bioassays are biochemically defined, not just cell proliferation. We look at the assays that have the steroid receptor, it's a, you know, the protein kinases, it has the activity, antioxidant activities, uh, like uh, you know, some sort of a um, uh, KI67 upregulation, things like that. So then, if it is if it found positive, you have an active extract. That extract undergoes mouse memory gland organ culture system. If it is active there, then it becomes a lead plant. If it is inactive in MMOC, it gets dropped and gets shelved. Now the lead plant goes through fractionation, and each plant is one thesis for a PhD student. In a, in a medicinal chemistry. So they fractionate them, and then all those fractions get evaluated in a selective bioassay. Selective bioassay is the one that bioassay which was positive to show the activity in the extract. So only one assay is done here, and you select an active fraction, and then the uh, medicinal chemists give that some name, that, you know, looking at the, whatever they are doing with their NMRs, and and literature and say, okay, you have a compound. Now, many times the compound they find is already in the literature. So then they have to go back to the drawing board to see that, you know, use another plant or, or see if there is another compound in there. Because they have no interest in, uh, you know, reinventing the wheels. They want to do something that's new and that everybody does, you know, PhD students. They don't want to like work on something that's already been done. They want to do something very novel, which is which they can say, which they can claim their own. So then that gets in. You have a you have you know activity. Now you have possible chemo preventive agent. It goes through MMOC and ACF, aberrant cryptosy of colon. If it is active, it goes forward. If it's inactive, it gets dropped. So here, this is a judgment call. Say that, okay, no, it's not active in my system. So they'll say, okay, then we're going to, uh, uh, you know, drop the compound. That's it. Then if it is, if it is active, then it becomes active chemopreventive agent. Then it gets synthesized large amounts for uh, in vivo carcinogenesis system against Richard Moon, which was uh, also in our lab. And then you show the activity. If the activity comes up, you study the mechanism of action, you get new grants very easily because now you have a new compound which was not known previously, has a very high activity, good potential, a right mechanism of actions with a huge number of preliminary data. So it, it gets uh, reviewed well. It's, you, know, you, get, uh, you get a good, uh, good review on that and you get, get funded. So then we have group becomes larger, new students, new postdoctoral fellows, and that's how the whole system works, okay? Now, the synthesis, then it becomes, we have to synthesize it uh, in a GMP, which is a good manufacturing practice, which is very expensive. You do that, you do preclinical toxicity, and then once it's approved by FDA, then you get the phase one clinical trials, and you have a chemopreventive agent. So as I was telling everybody yesterday, uh, Professor, I was that we are here, usually, we have to move forward. So the way to do it is to have the collaborations or whatever we do, but then we have to go to next step, identify a compound, something that, that is novel, that's not in the literature, and that will give you a really good recognition for, for the work we do. So uh, 
what happens is, for example, uh, in a several potentially active chemopreventive agents are obtained, you do it in cell culture, you identify lead compound, you determine activity, mechanism of action, you go in vivo, and then this is the protocol that I explained there. You have the primary test, you have a secondary test. If it's negative, you store it, you go forward if it is positive, you have active principle, you do secondary test, Secondary test is MMOC or ACF. It's negative, you drop it. If it's positive, you consider for development. So this slide is uh, 2000, uh, year two, 2002, 2003. At that time, we had done about 15,000 such tests. And we had done about 3,800 plants. And out of that, in short term assays, we found 800 positive, about 800 compounds are positive, and uh, I mean the extracts, sorry, plant extracts. And these extracts evaluated in organ culture out of 800, 229 were positive. So 500 plants were dropped at that stage. And then the active extract we evaluated in organ culture, and, and then we, uh, then, then we, found only 70, 70 positive from there, uh, right here, which are very high activity. So we selected them. And then the active pure chemopreventive from the fractions, this is supposed to be fractions, uh, that we tested, we found only 30 positive, that are isolated chemopreventive agents. And we got some other from, I had other projects, I got some more, and then from these, Based on toxicity and all that, we selected about 20 for further development. So the whole process, if you see, it, it's a very long, lengthy, uh, you know, time-consuming process. But it has a, you know, it gives you a good feeling at the end if you know if you come out with uh, with something that's uh, and that's positive. Okay. So experimental models for that we use for the. Uh, Studies, as I said, our memory gland organ culture, we did cell culture, toxicity, in vivo carcinogenesis, metabolism, and a mechanism of action. So this is the protocol I use for the memory gland organ culture. So just a step back in the memory gland organ culture uh, system, that was my PhD thesis. So, you know, the thesis paid, paid off pretty well <laughs> in, my, in my, my career. So the uh, whole idea was when I had a thesis uh, where I started in uh, Berkeley was that my boss uh, who passed away a few months ago, uh, Ranu Nandi, who was from uh, Kolkata. And um, so he had done, he was the first one who had done the effect of hormones in vivo for mammary gland development. The, so in mouse he would do the ovaryectomy. He will do the pituitary removal. He will look at the adrenal removal. He do the du double like ovary and pituitary removal. Like lots of combinations. And he came up with the thing that, okay, if you remove this, the pituitary, then this happens to the memory gland. If you remove ovary, the ducts, you know, you don't get the lobules. You don't get the pregnancy-like structure. If you do this, this happens. So when I joined his lab, he says, let's do this in vitro. So I started doing the mammary gland organ culture. We took out the gland, put this in the culture, and I started putting hormones in there. And I came up with the struct, with the hormonal combinations. So if you have insulin, prolactin, estrogen, progesterone, or insulin, prolactin, and aldosterone, those are three I like from many, many hormones and combinations. I showed that the, you can make the normal mammary gland from a ductal stage very early from young animals, I can make it look like a gland that's in the pregnant mouse uh, in six days. So you're cutting out the time, right? So it's a really good system. And then what I did is you remove the hormones. So I said, okay, I let it go for a few days. I remove the hormones, it goes back to the normal state. So that's just like a normal memory or, or breast physiology, that it goes back to the uh, original stage. You can stimulate it again by putting hormones. And if you 
while doing this if you put hydrocortisone in the medium uh, and these are serum free medium so there is no serum complication okay so i did it in serum free medium and then you put a hydrocortisone in it then that mammary gland secretes milk in the in the culture dish you can see the you can see the lipid droplets in the medium and you can see the casein expression you can see the alpha lactalbumin expression which are the major proteins uh, present in the milk so so then we took a step further and i said okay during the development of this pregnancy stage what happens if you put a carcinogen so we dumped some dmba in there so if i put a dmba there's nothing happening the glands look the same as the as you would see in pregnancy time in you know, about you know same time frame 6 7 days and then when i remove the hormones then as the control all the glands will go back to the ductal stage well when i had a dmba in there were some patches some areas where the dug where the cells did not regress they remain there you can see the lumps like you can see the growth of the cells that did not that did not respond to the withdrawal of the hormones meaning they had a altered hormonal responsiveness those cells were were not responding to hormonal withdrawal so i called them abnormal so what we did the next step is we took those cells and injected into the animals and we had to do two three four generations and then those lesions form tumors okay so now that gives a great model this all happens in 24 days it's a 24 day culture you have a, a gland growing for 10 days third day you put dmba you remove the hormones for another 14 days and you get these lesions so if i have two groups one group where i have control where i put dmba and go through this system and the second group i have a drug in there and if i don't see this <laughs> this uh, growth these lesions then those are cancer preventive agents okay that's the model so here it's in a in descriptive form in a 24 day culture we give dmba on day 3 for 24 hours then remove it and then you have growth promoting hormones insulin prolactin aldosterone or insulin prolactin estrogen and progesterone and i'll go to go to that in a second and then you do the regression you go up to 24 days if you give the chemo preventive agent before the carcinogen it's anti initiator if you give it after it works it's anti promoter and you keep it in the culture insulin prolactin aldosterone hydrocortisone induce alveolar lesions whereas uh, estrogen progesterone if i put it gives you ductal lesions now in human uh, the cancers are all ductal lesions so this is more relevant in terms of a in terms of a human situation whereas this one happens also but this is more like a proliferative proliferative lesion so if you look at the control in the absence of dmba when the regression occurs all the regression has gone off you go back to the ductal stage like this however in the presence of dmba the areas don't regress there are areas that don't regress and if you put vitamin d for example in this one at a 1 micromolar this one looks like that so that means it's a cancer preventive agent it prevented the growth of those those lesions in this particular so this one we used as the first step for practically all the compounds that we isolated or identified and then we then we go you know full blast on that and and do many different things so if you take a histolo- histopathological section in insulin prolactin and aldosterone these are the mammary alveolar lesions where you can see the uh, alveoli and they are very proliferative very big uh, thing and if you look at it in the control where you have the ductal uh ducts are all reversed or regressed you will see like plain ducts you will see some of this but most of it is is reversed and if you have a active cancer preventive agent that you call is effective the the section will look like that 
So now you are comparing that with this. Right? We don't take sections every time. The only if you have to do immunohistochemistry or some parameters. Otherwise, we'll just go and uh, uh, my technician will just count the lesions or do the imaging and tell you whether there is any activity or there is, you know, what percent and then compare that with the control. So we will be counting some of that that are not regressed. We, we count those also in the, in the system. Now, if you if you have the estrogen progesterone and, uh, uh, in the system instead of aldosterone, then you get ductal lesions. So if you look at the normal mammary gland after it's been reg regressed, the duct looks like that. This is the mammary duct. It's the epithelium, it has a lumen in there for the, like, you know, the milk ducts or whatever you, you have in the animals. And then you have the epithelial cells uh, like a single layer. Now what happens is that in a, uh, sometimes you get a hyperplastic, remember hyperplasia, number of cells increase, we see hyperplastic ducts, okay, and sometimes this is dysplastic, dysplasia is almost, almost, always going to cause cancer, so sometimes with DMBA we see a ductal lesion like this, and then you give the chemo preventive agent, then you have a big empty lumen here and this is uh, this is showing you the effect because now here you have again a single cell uh, layer like this with large lumen like here and here the, you have the uh, hyperplastic lesion with many layers of cells and there is an intact lesion so this is this is sort of pre-neoplastic and this one is dysplastic so this is bound to become cancer if you let it go long enough and it occludes the duct. So now the duct has no lumen and it's filled in with the with the, all these uh, abnormally growing cells. Now if you have a cancer therapy preventive agent in there and then you can, you can, it's more like that. So then you can say that well this, this drug or this compound has a potential to be a cancer preventive, cancer preventive agent. Make sense? Yes. Say yes is my thesis. Okay. So he. MMOC is dead. I mean, my lab. Because I was the one who was doing it. My technician is still there. But my postdocs, they just moved on. They're doing their own little thing. Some other labs are doing it. But, you know, because I'm gone. So, and this was an expensive, uh, you know, affair animals maintaining incubators and no so no no there is a there was there is a Mexican girl who worked for me for 15 years uh, lots of papers with me her name is uh, Hanoveva Murillo and so she's she's running the projects that I have because what happened is after I left um, I still am involved. There are a couple of different projects that uh, you know that got funded uh, with with good money, with you know, which I have uh, I have going. But I don't have a lab, so it's like you know all all it is. I go and do discussion. Somebody else has to has to finish the work. So so you have a uh, I was I was explaining somebody earlier in in terms of uh, chemoprevention of memory carcinogenesis you have to have a maximum dose, tolerated dose. As I explained in the previous uh, lecture that you have to take, uh, I think there was a question and then I answered saying that you have to have your drug into six different concentrations and find the concentration that's toxic, step down one concentration and then take 80% of that to look at the effect of that drug in memory carcinogenesis. If it is effective, then you have a chemo preventive agent. You can test it with the MNU or DMBA induced carcinogenesis, and then you look at the initiation promotion progression model and you study the toxicity. The protocol for that is very similar. We take a 35 day old animal, and for anti initiation study, we start them on the, on the compound and we overlap the carcinogen. We give carcinogen on day 50. MNU is given intravenously in the in the clavicle and near your neck. 
DMBA is giving gavach through the uh, gastric feeding and then you just let it go and for the anti-promotional agents we give the compound from here to here uh, and then one for screening we go all the way from here to the end of the study and the study usually goes for 180 days uh, for this for screening the study goes only up to 100 days so these are some of the results I, I'll show this slide again when I talk about vitamin D later uh, day after tomorrow but if you do the project like this with the MNU you have a control incidence of tumors and then you have a inhibition of uh, carcinogenesis and then at the intermediate dose you have a intermediate inhibition and then if you look at this uh, one of the things that if you have done the pre uh, screening of dose tolerance then you know that the effect you are getting is non-toxic because you have already taken out the toxicity out of the picture right and the way you measure whether there was a toxicity or not is you measure body weights so you weigh the animals and you always give a picture of body weight when you give your picture of incidence because if there was a decrease in body weight like this then these results don't mean anything because that means that you know the, it's, it's because you had a loss of body weight the tumors were starving and you go you, you got the negative or, or the, I mean the positive effect okay? and the uh, the bioactive compound that affects all the system is you have a carcinogen metabolism occurring, cell cycle involved, DNA repair, cell differentiation, hormonal regulation, and uh, cell apoptosis. So here is an example from the plant. So for example, when we had the plant, I, there's only one or two slides I put just because you are also in similar area. So when the plant extracts come to our lab, they have a P number. Okay, this is a plant number. And um, then all this plant number, the compounds were derived. So these are all the different compounds that have been derived from, from these plants and they have been tested. So this is just an example I gave. So for example, in this plant here, uh, you know, the medicinal chemist had identified a compound called uh, it's a carpalactone A. Now this plant, as I was telling you yesterday, is a tomato from where we make salsa. So it's an edible plant uh, and then you got the compound called the uh, ixocarpalactone. Catechin, some of them are, are uh, you know, have been, have been worked on pretty extensively, some of them have been dropped. So this is an example to the narrow it, then you narrow it down so for example in this this particular plant you came up with a compound called uh, called texcarol I, I don't remember that compound because it must not have good, very good you know very good activity then you have this one you come up with the odorin this was taken a little bit farther down but then uh, the ixocarpalactone one of my students uh, who was a that that's a really another thing like you know this the students how they become interested in research uh, Julie Choi is this this girl uh, who was working, who got admission, direct admission after high school. Here everybody gets direct admission in medicine. In the United States you get after five, four years of college. So you go through 12 years of high school, then you have four years of college, then you get into medical school and you do four more, five more years. So some students, they have a program called GPPA. Uh, that means guaranteed admission into medical school after high school. They are very bright kids. So Julie was a GPPA. She came to our lab and I asked her to work up this Ixacarpolactone uh, project. And she was really getting involved and all that. And then she got admission into medicine. She was doing her, you know, she started doing her medical rotation. She came back and she said, I want to do PhD with you because she just she just says that you know this medicine is is not really going to be you know my my cup of tea well she's she's practicing medicine now but she did get phd so she's md phd now but she worked on this ixacarpal lactone and but the, her thesis went on was not on ixacarpal lactone she, she worked on a a compound called azurine which is from bacteria 
and then she she had a little uh, 28 amino acid uh, uh, peptide that she isolated and worked on that for uh, for melanoma, and uh, and she got her PhD in that. So this hexacarpal actron we saw that it was very active. These are the colon cancer cell lines, and showed the activity in those and. So once it shows activity in one of these uh, cell types, then we take it further and then it becomes a targeted compound for colon cancer. And then it goes forward. So this is the structure of extracarpal actone. Uh, I showed this, I put this to show how the structures look like. This is a uh, flow cytometry. And if you look at it, the extracarpal actone has a G2 arrest. The cells are getting arrested in G2. And then this is the breakdown, and you can you know, not necessary to see right now. Otherwise, you won't be able to make it. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a G2 arrest. Uh, if you look at the uh, uh, its effect on uh, apoptosis, and yesterday I told you that you have to look at apoptosis at several different ways. And the apop this is control with rounded, nice green cells, normal. When you look at the apoptotic cell, you see this blabbing. This is blabbing, like you know, bubble type of things that come up in the cell. That means the cell is undergoing apoptosis. Okay, so that's what you see when you see the orange structure like this, like that. That means the cell is dying, and uh, so you look, you look for, look, look for this blabbing. So that's the cell apoptosis, uh, and we we showed that the cell apoptosis is occurring, and you count the number of cells in a, in a field. Uh, of your microscope and see how many cells are undergoing apoptosis, how many are dead. The dead cells are going to tell you how toxic it is and normal cells are going to say that which cells are not affected by it. Uh, there is another nuclear fragmentation. So you can see the uh, shrinkage and uh, of the in interior like condensation of all the chromatin that's occurring uh, in the uh, exocarpal actron treated treated animals, I mean cells. There's some more. I won't go into beam board because the apoptosis. So what I'm showing all this to show that how, what the logic occurs. So you said, okay, select an exocarpal lactone, show the inhibition, then you ran the apoptosis and say, okay, well, it's getting apoptosis. So then you have to do two, three different ways. The one procedure is, is okay, but when you say confirm it by two or three different pro procedures, then it's really good. So you confirm that it's apoptosis. Then what are the molecules in apoptosis, like by molecular markers that you want to see? So you want to look at the BCL2, BAX, BAD, and she selected the one based on the, uh, on the do domains that are BH2, BH1, these four domains. This is a BCL2 gene structure with four BH domains, where there is a beam board that was very new at that time. We were doing beam board does not have the later uh, uh, two two structural domains of the of the of the BCL2 gene, and that was really correlated with with the uh, correlated with the cell apoptosis. And she showed that where the beam beam board was was actually you can you, you can look at the a control and it was like carpal acton with different days and you can see as you go that there was an enhancement in that and BCL2 uh, had had not that much of effect because that was that was like you know um, still normalized with your actin. Now the colon cancer model for ACF we use the azoxymethane two injection as a model. So what happens is that you take the animals and um, then you give them two injections of AOM and you start your treatment for promotion, just same protocol as memory. Initiation here, promotion there, you sacrifice the animal standards after a week after that and then you can study the uh, aberrant crypt foci and for carcinogenesis study you take it further down. So it's anti-initiation, anti-promotion, and the entire, entire time frame uh, uh, to study the activity. 
and so these are the crypts okay these are the crypts so the either the uh, colon have no crypts one or two crypts like here or it has more than like it has three crypts three here or it has uh, four crypts or it has more than six six and more so these are all aberrant cryptophosi we have them in the human also and that's used for human as a marker for cancer prevention also in uh, in many many systems now while doing that we also identified a enzyme called hexosaminidase so hexosaminidase uh, is a is a normal constituent of a normal cell so this is normal uh, is present when you have the loss of a uh, loss of loss of hexosaminidase you will see the green structure like that okay so this is the LOH of normal area this is the LOH of the uh, uh, of the ACL loss of LOH and then you can correlate this with the number of crates and that you can use as a marker and I won't go into this but this slide shows the different compounds and we had like papers we have dagrin paper we have saponin paper we have promagranate paper and we have different flower papers showing the effect on ACL and this we talked about it yesterday is how the wind signaling works and let me see my time five ten minutes five minutes or, or call it off do it in the afternoon lunch okay let's break it for lunch all right so what i'll do is i'll finish off this talk there were five ten slides left not too many and then in the afternoon we'll be talking about uh, work that's being done in the lab so this is a little more interesting than listening to the videos you will run it is it okay oh i thought that okay so yeah so dagulin i'm going to be talking a lot about dagulin later on because that's my newfound drug that we have uh, it was all in the Chicago Tribune and newspapers and everything. UIC means University of Illinois, Chicago. Uh, attacks cancer's root. I mean, whatever. What? Okay, so we have worked on variety of different compounds. We have worked on vitamin D. We have worked on the sapote, means chiku. Chiku, right? So, sapote, Mondelea cerecia, this is a dagulin. Uh, Sapotin comes from, from this. We worked on resveratrol. We worked on pomegranate and we worked on exocarpolactone. This is just the nutritional, like fruit based. And we worked on the uh, carcinogens in, uh, you know, effect of resveratrol on cigarette, I mean, cigarette smoke induced lung cancers. And I'll talk about it also later on. This is a really important study, but it'll take me a little bit more time to explain this. But this was published. Uh, uh, Lorna White was my postdoc from Ireland and she did this work. It's really beautiful work, uh, but I can, I can explain it later on. Uh, it's a new concept in there. <coughs> and uh, the TRAMP model that you know, many of my friends are using in, uh, in USA, it's a, uh, it induces the uh, prostate cancer in the animals in, uh, in natural form. So these ones are some of the results we showed. This is a resveratrol we published in Science, uh, showing you the activity of resveratrol that's present in red wine and, and in grapes. Uh, that, that, that first paper was from our lab. Uh, the uh, betulinic acid, I was not there, but Pazuto showed that in, uh, he published it in Nature, Nature Medicine. Then this one is a for bromoflavon. This is dropped now because of the toxicity uh, found later on and having no effect. But all you can see is that if you look at the control versus inhibition, they have a very dramatic uh, effects and that's why I'm showing. So that makes the case for these compounds for further development. So any of these compounds that you pick up and see the literature, you can pick up and make your own project on that and it works very well. Uh, this is dagulin. I'll be talking about dagulin later on. 
but this is a cancer research but the original Dagulin paper came out in Nature Medicine and <coughs> this one here is oh, this is a Dagulin so uh, the one I was showing you that two different concentrations you had just dramatic effect on the skin carcinogenesis and there are some of the other compounds that uh, we have papers on and we worked on are brassinin from cabbage, uh, resveratrol from grape, brucetrol from non-edible plant, non-edible plant, sepotin from chiku, ixocarpal actin from tomato. And there are lots of other chemopreventive agents there and this slide you have. So you can, you can go through these in your system. Now, few more minutes. No? Chalo, chalo. Yeah, okay. This is drug development, how the drug is going through the FDA. I'll talk about it in the after afternoon. Encyclopedia. <laughs> 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 
all the aspects of the uh, chemotherapeutic and chemotherapeutic. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure. Yeah. I really enjoy it. He's so humble. He's so uh, knowledgeable person. And you can get maximum benefit from him. He's still working and uh, has lots of plants. And he can help the youngsters also. You can discuss with him for placement and other things. So you take benefit of him. Thank, thank you. Thank you.